Please stand as you are able for our call to worship. Jesus came to proclaim peace to those far from God. Through Christ, we all have access to God. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Creator God, you have always been and forever will be. There is no other Lord but you. The heavens are yours and all the earth and its peoples. Creator God, fill us with sight so that we may understand and see your will in the world and so that we may walk softly on the earth as one with you and your creation. This we pray in the name of your Son, who reigns with you through the power of your Spirit. Amen. I now invite us to a time of silent confession.
hear the good news. Through Jesus Christ, we gain access to God by God coming and being with us. That proves God's love towards us. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. As a forgiven and reconciled people, let us show signs of Christ's peace to one another. The peace of Christ be with you. Peace to the Lord. Please join me in the prayer for illumination found in your bulletin. Open our ears to hear your word. Our Old Testament reading is the second of the four servant songs found in the book of Isaiah. Christians have historically identified the servant as the Messiah and these songs as prophecies of his coming. Jews have always interpreted the servant songs as referring corporately to the people and nation of Israel. In this servant song, the servant is specifically referred to as Israel. We do not have to choose between the Christian and the Jewish interpretations. Scriptures are capable of more than one meaning, and prophecies can have more than one fulfillment. Both interpretations are valid and good. Hear these words of the second servant song in the first four verses of Isaiah 49, 1 through 7. Listen to me, O coastlands. Pay attention, you peoples from far away. The Lord called me before I was born. While I was in my mother's womb, he named me. He made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand, he hid me. He made me a polished arrow. In his quiver, he hid me away. And he said to me, you are my servant, Israel, in whom I will be glorified. But I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing and vanity. Yet surely my cause is with the Lord and my reward with my God. And now the Lord says, who formed me in the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him and that Israel might be gathered to him. For I am honored in the sight of the Lord and my God has become my strength. He says, it is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the survivors of Israel. I will give you as a light to the nations that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. Thus says the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel and his Holy One, to one deeply despised, abhorred by the nations, the slave of rulers. Kings shall see and stand up, princes, and they shall prostrate themselves. Because of the Lord, who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel, who has chosen you. The word of the Lord.
Hear now a reading from the Gospel. From the Gospel of John, the first chapter. Jesus, the Lamb of God. The next day, he saw Jesus coming toward him and declared, Here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks ahead of me, because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but I came baptizing with water for this reason, that he might be revealed to Israel. And John further testified, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. And I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I myself have seen and have testified that this is the Son of God. The next day, John again was standing with two of his disciples, and as he watched Jesus walk by, he exclaimed, Look, here is the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. When Jesus turned and saw them following, he said to them, What are you looking for? They said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, Come and see. They came and saw where he was staying, and they remained with him that day. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his brother, Simon, and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which is translated the anointed. He brought Simon to Jesus. Jesus looked at Simon and said, You are Simon, son of John. You are to be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. The Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Some of you know the place Lake Junaluska. Lake Junaluska is the assembly grounds of the United Methodist Church for the southeastern jurisdiction of our conference or of our church. Lake Junaluska being the assembly grounds is where all the leaders of our church gather periodically throughout the year. Lake Junaluska is a beautiful lake and resort area just about 45 minutes west of Asheville. Lake Junaluska is known among Methodists for its place in our leadership structure, but for me, growing up, it was simply where my family went for the summer. My grandfather was a pastor in the Western North Carolina Conference, and in his day, pastors only lived in parsonages, so the only home he ever owned was a little log cabin at the top of Littleton Road in Lake Junaluska, North Carolina. My mom taught school, and so when school was out, and it's not only children who look forward to school being out, but as a school teacher, when school was out, she hit the road, she took the kids, and even though Dad didn't have 10 weeks of vacation, the three of us did, and we were up in the mountains. And Julie and I, we felt like we owned that lake. We could wander around and take all the shortcuts between neighbors' yards and houses, going all the way down to the lakeside. I would fish with my friends, and we would count how many fish we would keep and then throw back. I remember one day spending it with two of my best friends fishing. We caught 97 fish that day. I suspect we actually fed about 15, and they just ate about five or six times. <laughs> that math doesn't work out, but I'm not a mathematician. <laughs> we felt like we owned that lake. We knew every corner and crevice every back road, every backyard. And I made friends there in those summers that I've kept for a lifetime. My sister, too. They were friends who were like family. In fact, for one summer, Mary was basically family. 
Mary, her parents also were up there for the summers, but that particular summer when we were all in high school, their family was coming and going so much, and Mary had a job at the lake, just like Julie and I, and we all decided that it would just be best if Mary lived with the Kings. And so this friend who was like family became, for 10 weeks, like family, our family. She was there in the spare bedroom. She was there at meals. She was there hanging out on the weekends. Mary was always quick with a laugh. She was always the one to make us see the world a little differently, a little askew. And it was always better when we saw it from her perspective. It was fun to have Mary in the house. She was a year younger than me, a year older than Julie. She fit right in except that she turned our world upside down a little bit that summer. You see, to be around Mary was to see her worldview constantly. And so the very everyday kinds of things take on a new light with Mary. Going to the grocery store, for instance. You weren't just shopping for groceries, but you were talking about the state of the world. That cereal tastes good, I'm sure, but, but how does General Mills treat its workers? The, those eggs, I'm sure they're great, but, but in what factory were they farmed? Or were they factory farmed? Maybe could they be cage free? Could we look and see if they're even free range? Mary would have a little book, a little book of social responsibility. All the corporations were actually ranked according to workers' rights and care of animals and the implica implications of their business practices on global health. It was amazing to see the world from Mary's perspective. I think it was that summer that the phrase was introduced to me for the first time, think globally, act locally. That's what Mary did every day. She was acting locally, doing everyday things, but always with a mind to what are the global implications. And that's not easy. It's not easy, but it opened up a whole new world for us. Of course, Mary didn't originate the notion. And as I've grown, I've realized its commonalities, the commonalities between think globally, act locally, with the teachings of Jesus. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Take those maxims seriously, and it makes your head hurt. It makes your heart hurt, too because those are difficult things to do all the time, every day, in everyday experience. See where unconditional love for the world will lead you, and it will lead you to teachings like this. Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Do good to those who hate you. That's a vision of the world made whole again. It's a vision of a world interconnected. John the Baptist is standing by the water and Jesus walks by and he sees the one on whom the Spirit rests. Here is the Lamb of God, says John, who takes away the sin of the world. And everyone looks at Jesus. And a few begin to follow. Here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. We hear that phrase, we hear that scripture in a moralistic sense, and that's regrettable, because for the Gospel of John, sin is not so much moral failing as it is disconnection from the Creator. It is living without God in mind. It is thinking that the world is only about you. It is thinking that this life is only ours and nothing else. It is thinking incorrectly, much more even than doing. That's the root of sin, forgetting that God is present here, now, even locally. Dave Harwood is a pastor here in our church, in our midst, retired to this community. He makes a great observation about Christianity. 
He says that Christianity is exclusive in its inclusivity. Jesus takes away the sin of the world. We, as Christians who follow this Lord, we are called to love the whole world. We are a faith who is exclusive in that we give our love away to everyone. We believe that God already has reconciled the world to himself in Christ. In Christ Jesus, we are all already connected. It's this sense of connection that Methodists have always had. We as a denomination, began as a reform movement within the Church of England, within the Episcopal Church. We began as a spiritual renewal movement, one based on individuals' convictions of following Christ, individuals who wanted to turn their lives over to God in Jesus began to form together in bands, and then those larger bands into societies groups that help to hold one another accountable to this methodical way of living. It was a way to take the the global faith and apply it locally, personally. A way to take an abstract faith of beliefs and turn it into action. And we stood out because of it. Methodists were so known for their mission in the world, their service in the world, their evangelism in the world, that others took notice. Bishop Hope Morgan Ward is the bishop of the North Carolina Annual Conference. She was a pastor here in this conference for decades when she was elected to our episcopacy. And for eight years as a bishop, she first served Mississippi before then being reassigned to North Carolina two years ago. Bishop Ward tells the story of being down in Mississippi for her first year and forming a relationship with the Episcopalians in the state. The Bishop of the Episcopal Diocese and Bishop Ward of the Methodists, they covenanted to have communion once a year and to pray for one another throughout the year and for, they covenanted to guide all of their churches to look on a local level toward one another and build relationships. It was a great idea, they thought, and and the Episcopalians in the first meeting, they said, well, we ought to celebrate this covenant on Wesley's feast day. And Bishop Ward said to herself, Wesley's feast day? (laughs) And as she says, she, she knows just from experience that if you sort of wait and are silent long enough, things will be revealed. And so she just was quiet and acted like she knew what they were talking about, and then they started talking about March, and she surmised, oh, the Episcopalians have a feast day celebrating John Wesley every March. Do you know the scripture they read on that feast day is the passage we read this morning from Isaiah. Isaiah 49, the Lord called me before I was born, while I was in my mother's womb, he named me. That sense of being claimed before you're even aware, that sense of grace coming before we're even aware, provenient grace we call it in the Methodist church, that grace that gives you a purpose a purpose to which you awake over time. In the shadow of his hand, he hid me, says the text. Takes time for our awareness of our purpose to grow. And he said to me, you are my servant Israel in whom I will be glorified. But don't we hesitate at claiming that? After all, it sounds so presumptuous. But this is a text that others apply to us. This is a text that others see Methodists living out. That others see Methodists 
embodying. You know from experience that you can have as many opinions about yourself as you want, but it's the opinions of others that really tell you who you are. The Episcopalians have said this text describes us. And yet we're hesitant, aren't we? We don't want to be presumptuous, and we feel we've fallen short. But I said, I've labored in vain. I've spent my strength on nothing and vanity. Who among us doesn't doubt ourselves? Who among us doesn't have thoughts of self-recrimination for shortcomings in our past? Yet we can claim this gift. Isaiah says, surely my cause is with the Lord. My reward is with my God. And now the Lord says, it is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob, to restore the survivors of Israel. It is too light a thing that you should tend only your own. It is too light a thing that the blessing God gives should be kept to oneself. I will give you, proclaims the Lord, I will give you as a light to the nations that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. You will be used in ways that you cannot even imagine. This grace, this blessing that's been given to you, you will not keep to yourself because it will not be contained. You might look around locally and act but your actions will be global in their reach. This is the text. This is the description that others give us. Methodists, called to mission, called to service, called to evangelism in the best sense of the word, a word we ought to reclaim. For we as Methodists, have followed the light of Jesus Christ and have shaped our world locally in ways that have global reach. That is what it means to be the church, individually and collectively to submit ourselves to the light of Jesus Christ, to reflect that light as much as we can daily, to be ones who recognize that it's not up only to us. In fact, that we're not even able just in ourselves to truly impact the world. But, but if we will give ourselves over to a love that is unconditional, to a love that reaches beyond us, to a love that seeks to involve all the world, if we surrender to that love, then God will transform us and place us in service in ways that allow God also to transform others. God has given you a purpose etched in your being before you were born. Over time, that purpose will be revealed. And when it is revealed, you will be an instrument of grace, an instrument used by the one who is grace, Christ Jesus our Lord. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.
let us continue in the spirit of the song that answers all of those questions with an affirming, resounding yes by affirming our faith in our bulletins. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus, crucified and risen, our judge and our hope, in life and death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen. You may be seated. This morning, it's my pleasure to introduce to you two who come to join our church. Jamie and Lori Brooks are coming down here to this area from Illinois, and they've taken different paths to get here. Jamie, or Lori, I'm sorry, uh, is joining from First United Methodist Church in Tifton, Georgia. She's been a Methodist for a long time. And then just her husband here, Jamie, is coming over from Greensboro and is uh, joining by profession of faith. Lori grew up and became a special education teacher. And then when the three kids came along, she started working at home and working hard at home. William and Anna are up here and are a little shy, so they don't want to join you. <laughs> Anna's waving, and that's good. <laughs> and Molly, their one-and-a-half-year-old, is in the nursery. They came from Illinois where, after a time in the Navy, flying helicopters, Jamie came down and is, became working at Sears, and then after a while, for the family's benefit, everyone moved down to Chapel Hill. We all agree with that. For the family's benefit, everybody moves to Chapel Hill. They now own their own company here in the Triangle and have found our church and are looking forward to Molly being baptized and the kids continuing in the programs and getting more involved. This day, we welcome you and we look forward to both of you being full members in this body, in this community of the church. Dolores will ask you the questions of faith and of membership. When we profess our faith in Christ, we become a part of a family, the family of God. And as such, we come and celebrate the fact that you are now about to say yes to God and to God's plan and purpose for your life. And so on behalf of the whole church, I ask you, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? If so, say, I do. Do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in his grace, and promise to serve him as your Lord in union with the church which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races? According to the grace given to you, Will you remain faithful members of Christ's holy church and serve as Christ's representatives in the world? As we are received into the family of God, we're also received into the United Methodist Church here today. We are a part of a worldwide connection, and we thank God for that wonderful relationship that we share with the United Methodists around the world. John Wesley said, I look upon the whole world as my parish, and we are a part of that worldwide connection of Methodists in Christ. And so as we receive you into the United Methodist Church as a whole, let me ask you this question. As members of Christ's universal church, will you be loyal to the United Methodist Church and do all in your power to strengthen its ministries? And then as you are received into this local congregation, this particular body of Christ here at University United Methodist Church, as members of this congregation, will you faithfully participate in its ministries by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? Members of the household of God, I commend Jamie and Lori to your love and care. Do all in your power to increase their faith Confirm their hope, 
and perfect them in love. With God's help, we will proclaim the good news and live according to the example of Christ. We will surround you with a community of love and forgiveness that you may grow in your service to God and be found faithful in your service to others. We will pray for you that you may be true disciples who walk in the way that leads to life. of kindred minds is like to that above. Today we come celebrating our God who is love and that communion that we share together as Christian community. We give thanks today for our new members, Jamie and Laura, and their family. And we are so grateful to God for bringing them to us and for our part in helping them to continue to grow in their spiritual life. We thank God today for the simple gifts, life, help, family, friends, and we pray that God would continue to knit us closer together in Christ, with Christ and each other. Today we lift up our concerns, but we also are thankful for the ability to participate in a week of prayer for affordable housing, which is going on around this community with other churches as well. And we pray that God will continue to help us be a part of finding affordable housing for people so that they may live in safety and in dignity. We also pray for all of those people who have labored for the Lord and who have been willing to put their lives on the line so that all might live with freedom and equality and justice. And today we especially remember Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., as we celebrate his legacy and his life. And we lift up many people that we know and also those further afield who are in need of our prayers today. We pray for Kay Long, who is in the hospital, and Nancy Jennings as well, both dealing with cancer diagnoses. We pray for Tyler Douglas, an eight-year-old little boy who is dying of cancer. And we pray for Judy Wilson's mom, who is in intensive care in the hospital, but doing a little bit better. And we pray that she will continue on the road to recovery. We also pray for Betty Phillips as she continues to recover from hip surgery. And we lift up in joy today Brian Sigmund, who was a former uh, youth minister here, and uh, many of you may remember Brian, in the birth of his new son, Caleb, to he and his wife, Amy. Today we also pray for the people of Afghanistan and we remember those people who were killed in the attack just the other day in Kabul. And we pray for victims of injustice for whatever reason that they may suffer. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Faithful God, before we were born, you formed us in the womb and called us by name. And you continue to claim us as your beloved children and your chosen ones. We praise you, O God, for this high and holy calling upon our lives to be a light to the nations so that all creation might know your healing love, which is salvation. Strong deliverer, Help our lives to be a witness to your glory. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, our strength, we come recognizing our need for you and for the help and strength that only you can give. We are weak, but you are strong. And we trust in you to help us in all of the challenges and changes of life. We pray today, O oh God, for those who are weak or weary, who are hurting and in need of hope. O oh God, bread of heaven, 
feed us till we want no more. Make your presence known and cover us all with your grace as you show us how to be vessels of grace to one another. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O God, our rock and our redeemer, we thank you for the new life that you give us when we turn our lives over to you, for showing us the way to you through Jesus, through his life, his death, his resurrection, we give you thanks. We pray for one another in our need and for the world which you so love. Open our hearts, O oh God, that we may love as you love and serve joyfully in your name. This we pray in the name of the one who is our Lord and Savior Jesus, as he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Sisters and brothers, God is good. All the time. And all the time. I am thankful that my Christian journey has caused me to end up in the United Methodist Church, and one of those reasons I'm thankful is we're able to hold together a broad vision of global thinking with the General Conference and each individual local expression of the church. This morning in your bulletin, you'll see the Human Relations Day, which is one of the special offerings that the entire United Methodist Church takes up. And this offering is a, a way to respond both globally with our United Methodist Conf uh, Church and then locally through supporting local initiatives to support homeless and at-risk youth throughout our connection. I invite you to please consider this as a way in which we can put our faith into action. Also this morning, if you're sitting on the inside of the row, I invite you to take the fellowship pad to sign it and hand it down so we might know who we are in worship alongside this morning by name and greet one another after the service. In front of you is a prayer card. I invite you, if you have joys, concerns, or other information you would like to share with us as a clergy staff and as a staff, um, that you can hand that in the offering plate as it comes by. This morning, we give to God our tithes, our offerings, our very selves.
day as you prepare to receive this benediction. I want again to invite you to be part of Connection Sunday next Sunday to learn more about our church. And today, just after this service, if you want to learn a little more or just visit with one of the clergy, our coffee with clergy, it's just through these doors and down the hallway. Brian will be there this afternoon. Or if you just want coffee, you can head that way too. I know that you will want after the service also to visit with Jamie and Lori Brooks and to welcome them into our fellowship. I know that you will want to reach out in love and continue to welcome all into this fellowship. Receive this benediction. Martin Luther King Jr. said, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. That's a way of saying think globally, act locally. We think sometimes that our spiritual life is just shared in little everyday children's songs, but even children's songs have vital impact. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. I've always thought about that as a children's song. Until recently, it was pointed out to me that that, that song was a song sung by freedom riders as they drove south. That song is a song sung by people in prison after beatings, standing up for their rights. That song is a song sung by martyrs. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This day, take your light. Name it, claim it as a reflection of the light of Jesus Christ. And let that light shine. Let God use it to do more than you can imagine. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.